The Ludlow, Colorado coal miner strike took place in the early 20th century. Many families died after the Colorado National Guard burned down the tent city where the miners and their families were living. Hi, I'm Shannon, and this week on the Lectures in History podcast, Professor Fawn Amber Montoya of Colorado State University shares those families' stories and how they're remembered today. Okay, Um, so, sorry, I always get nervous. This is actually one of the hardest lectures that I give, um, and it's because there's this mixture of history, but there's also some personal stories in it. And for me, um, I just kind of a little bit of background. So for those of you that don't know um, or have heard, who's ever heard of the Ludlow Massacre? Okay, so one, two, about 70% of you, okay. Um, in the mid-2000s, uh, archaeologists at um, the University of Denver did a survey of Coloradoans, and they found that less than 70% of people had ever he- in Colorado had ever heard of the Ludlow Massacre. Um, and of those that had heard of, the Lud- heard of the Ludlow Massacre, they thought that it was a massacre um, by Native Americans killing white settlers. Okay, um, so... Uh, Just a little bit of background um, for my experience with the Ludlow Massacre. Um, I grew up in southern Colorado. My family has lived here for the past 150 years. Um, Ludlow was actually my first field trip in the third grade. Um, I um, uh, went to college. I ended up studying with an individual who had done research on southern Colorado um, Hispanics. Um, And I had the opportunity to do research at the CFNI um, archives, which is our steel mill in our community. in the past couple of years, I was also able to sit on the um, Ludlow Centennial Commission. So it had been 100 years since the Ludlow Massacre. It was a government acqu- uh, governor-appointed commission. Um, I ended up being the co-chair of the commission. I'm going to have you guys scoot in just a little bit. I hope that doesn't mess it up too much. Um, and so when I think about Ludlow, I think about most of my, per- my personal connections, but I also think about the history of it. When I first heard of Ludlow again, I was a little kid. Um, when I sat on the Ludlow Centennial Commission, I had children by that time. And so after having children, Ludlow meant something significantly different to me than it had before. Um, so what I'm going to start off with, I'm going to tell the story um, of three different families. The first one is the Petrucci family, the second one is the Costa family, and then the last one is the Rockefeller family. Um, And I'm going to start off playing a little bit of a song, and this is about Mary Petrucci and some of her experiences in the um, winter of 1913 and 1914. I'm only going to play about a minute of it. Mary and her husband took their children to town to ride the train to Trinidad. Two soldiers come around. She didn't know their names, but she'd seen them both before. At the old house up in Ramey, they used to knock on Mary's door. They said, Where you think you're going? Where are you going today? You best take your children home, but your husband will have to stay. At six ten we'll leave this morning, but you can't board at this depot. You can't ride the train out of Ludlow. So this is a song that was sung in 2014 at the 100th anniversary of what um, was known as the Ludlow Massacre. These are Mary's four children um, in the fall of 1913. Uh, she has um, Bernard, um, Mary, uh, Lucy, sorry, it's Lucy, um, Frank, and I think it's Joe. This is the Costa family. This is Selena Costa, and this is her husband, Charlie Costa. These are her children. Again, this is in the spring of, I'm sorry, the fall of 1913. Um, Mary is married to a coal miner. Uh, she is also the daughter of a coal miner. Her brothers are all coal miners. So she's someone who had grown up in the coal fields of southern Colorado. Um, Cetalina Costa also is in a similar situation where she's married to a coal miner. Um, and so one of the things that happens in southern Colorado is that the winter, the, um, winter of 1912 and 1913 is really, really dangerous in the southern Colorado coal mines um, for a variety of reasons because coal mining is a dangerous profession regardless of what people 
um, might argue um, even today is that you have people that are digging into the earth to be able to extract this coal. Um, so the women of these families are used to hearing um, of accidents. They have family members who may have been involved in accidents. So the coal mining profession is not just about the men going out and laboring. Okay. Um, the next family that I'm, I'm going I'm to go into more detail about Mary um, and Cedalina later on. Um, the next family that I want to talk about is the Rockefeller family. And this is John D. Rockefeller Jr. And this is John D. Rockefeller Sr. Okay. Um, and so what I want you to do is I want you to pull out your cell phones. And I want you to Google wealthiest American that has ever lived. or Yahoo, or Bing, or Safari, whatever your chosen search engine is. I'm just a, I'm a Googler. I just accept it. Actually, we'll Google Google. So who do we find? We find John D. Rockefeller, right? Whose wealth even today, if you compared it dollars to dollars and U.S. dollars today, would still be considered one of the wealthiest Americans that had ever lived. Does anyone know how he was able to amass his wealth? Okay, perfect. So there's this idea of a monopoly, right? So what does a monopoly look like? You own everything. Okay, so explain it. So you have these other companies that distribute oil. However, you own them through corporate rights, through oil rights. So they might be able to sell it, but you still get all the profit for it. So okay. you can set prices how you want because you have no competition. And they still have to buy it because they can't get it anywhere else. Okay, so you have what's called a horizontal monopoly, right? So if this is, I owned all the gas stations, but one was named Conoco, one was named Shell, one was Loaf and Jug, one was 7-Eleven, but I own all of them. Okay, that's one way of having a monopoly. The other way of having a monopoly is a vertical monopoly, right? So then it's, I own the oil fields, I own the, um, the gas manufacturing, I own the gas stations, and then I own the power plants. Okay, so that's actually how Rockefeller is able to amass his wealth, and he does it predominantly through the company Standard Oil in the East Coast. The Rockefeller family at the turn of the 20th century will actually invest in Southern Colorado because Southern Colorado, through coal, is also a fuel company as well. And so they'll take their monies that they had invested on the East Coast and they'll start investing them in Southern Colorado. Okay? The other thing, though, is how often do you think that John D. Rockefeller Sr. or Jr. are actually going to show up in Southern Colorado? Never. Never. Right? Because why would, I know that some of you think this, like, why would you come to Pueblo? Right? It's this middle, middle of nowhere. There's really not a lot happening here. Right? Then it's the West. And so if they're going to come here, they're going to have to come out by train. Right? And then they're going to maybe have access to little rickety old cars. Or rickety cars are not old at that point. They're new. Right? So and actually to get from Denver to Trinidad is going to take a little bit of effort. Okay? So it's really important about the Rockefeller family is they're actually not physically present in Southern Colorado, so they're not observing what's happening. Um, for life, um, for mining, what is that? Do you think that would look like? Without reading my slide, I know it's, I've already jumped to it for you, but what does life look like? Obviously dangerous. I'm gonna ha can I have you repeat it? Obviously dangerous, and then they probably aren't making that much money because okay. it's a hard labor, like blue collar job, so they're working really, really hard. So probably some kind of poverty. Okay. Okay. So they're in poverty. But they're working, right? So they're working long days, but they still don't have any money. Okay. Um, so the best example ways that I can explain this is I call it a, a cycle of debt peonage, and I'm going to kind of relate it to your student loans. Okay. So <laughs> you're going to go to college, right? So for some of you, in order to be here, you actually have to take out student loans to actually pay for everything, right? And so every year you end up having to take out more because that's what happens when you're in college: the costs increase and your life increases, right? So you're going to graduate from high school, from college. And what is probably the first thing you're going to need? Okay, you're going to get you're going to get a job. Let's say you're going to be awesome and you're going to make forty five thousand dollars a year. Okay, um, is that it? It's like okay, I have a job. I'm gonna. Where are you going to live? You're going to have an apartment. You're going to buy a house. Nothing. You're going to stay with your parents. <laughs> you're probably going to stay with your parents and live off them until they kick you out. Okay, so let's imagine that you're going to buy a house at some point, and you've been driving a crappy car around for a while, so you're probably going to buy a new car, which you're going to end up taking loans out for, and then your student loans come due. So all of a sudden, you start looking at your debts, and you realize that your debt-to-income ratio is out of balance, right? And so you're basically having to live in the cycle of debt, and this is, this is the experience of many Americans today, right? So that's what will happen to individuals living in Southern Colorado, because in order to live in Southern Colorado, you have to have a house to live in. 
Okay, and the company comes up with this great idea. Okay, and this is what the coal miners had been living in before the company comes in. They've been living in adobe structures. And so on the bottom it says, the sort of houses the Mexican employees built for themselves at Segundo. And this says the sort of houses that the company builds for them. So about 1903, 1904, the company decided we're going to build all these wood structures because we don't want our employees living in dirt. Okay, so they tear down these houses or they have them move out and then they put them in these wood houses. What do you think the first thing the company does when they move them into the wood house? Charge them rent. Charge them rent. (laughs) Right? So before there was no rent, now there's rent due. Okay? What do you think, what do you use to heat these homes? Coal. Coal. And do you think they're going to give them a discount? No. It's going to be at cost. Okay? So you were living here. Is it easier to heat an adobe house or to heat a wood house? Adobe house. Why? Insulated. How is it insulated? Naturally. Naturally. So Adobe is what? Go ahead. Mud and hay? Mud and hay. So it's dirt, right? And it's about this thick, right? So you have a wall about this thick replaced with a wood wall about this thick, right? <clears throat> and this is a natural insulation that the goal of the Adobe is supposed to cool in the summertime and it would help keep the houses warm in the wintertime. So you're going to use less coal to heat this house than you're going to heat this house, right? So you get charged rent. You have to pay at cost for coal, right? In the coal camps, you have to shop at the company store, and they get pay you in scrip, which is they don't pay you in U.S. currency. They pay you in company money, okay? So you might work, let's say you make $100 in a month, but maybe your first cost is you have to pay for it, $20. Say this is just in general average. And then that whole month as you've been working, you had to borrow money or borrow products from the company store or put it on credit, so then you have to pay off the company store, right? And you have to buy your coal. So what ends up happening is eventually at the end of the month, the miners don't have a lot of money, and the money that they do have is company script. So if they complain about their employer, what's going to happen? They're going to what? They're going to lose their job, right? And if the Rockefellers own a monopoly in the East Coast, you think there's going to be a monopoly of coal in Southern Colorado. Right. So if you look at Southern Colorado, Walsenburg was a mining community. Trinidad and all around it were mining communities, right? Rouse Rouse is a mining community. So all of these communities in Southern Colorado are owned by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, which is the Rockefeller family at the time, okay? And then your steel mill as well. So if you get blacklisted or you say, I'm not going to work at one location, you're not going to work at any of those locations, okay? Questions about this? This is really, really key because we're talking about populations, coal miners living in southern Colorado, who cannot leave the area. Okay? The, also, the majority of coal miners are coming from other areas. Okay? You, from about 1890 until 1910, you'll have immigration coming from all areas. You have 19 to 21 different languages that are spoken in southern Colorado at the time. Okay? Um, sorry, I'm going to go back. So in these working conditions, you also have these dangerous conditions. Um, and again, uh, t- 1912 and 1913 are considered to be some of the dan- most dangerous years in Colorado for mining accidents. So you have to think about your, your coal miners, you're digging into the side of the mountain. The further in you go in, the better coal you're going to get. Okay? So as you're digging into the side of the mountain, what are you going to need to actually dig into the side of the mountain? You're going to need explosives to dig into the side of the mountain. Okay? That's like the hugest thing. So you're going to put dynamite into the mountain. You're going to light it off. Right? And as it explodes, can you control that explosion? No. So you might have mining collapses. You might get killed in that instance. Right? As you go in, you're actually putting up timbers or, um, to kind of protect you as you're going in to the mountain. Okay? So as you're digging, when you're actually at this place where there's coal, right, what do you use to light? Do you have electric lights at that point? You have handheld kerosene lanterns. Right? So you're mining, you're digging into the, gr- into the ground, you're using pickaxes. If a rock falls and breaks open that kerosene lantern, what happens? It explodes because there's all the coal dust in the air. Okay? So there were Colorado mine safety laws that existed that were supposed to t- protect workers in these conditions. The Colorado Fuel and Iron Company did not abide by those laws. Okay? So in the fall of 1913, coal miners in southern Colorado decided to go on strike. And they go on strike after one of the um, union organizers is actually shot on the streets of Trinidad. And this upsets people in the coal mines. They decide to go on strike. The strike will start in September of 1913. 
what happens do you think to the company owners, um, or how does the company owners respond when their workers go on strike? See you later. We'll see you later, because you've just been living in this awesome company-owned home that we tore down your other house for. You're living in this one, but it's owned by the company. Am I going to let you to continue to let you live in this house if you refuse to work for me? No. So they end up getting evicted. Okay, and they move on to the plains of southern Colorado. Sorry, I'm a little bit ahead of myself because I need this. I need this picture of the tent colony. So um, outside of uh, one of the when the miners are evicted from their homes, a group of them will live, move onto the plains of southern Colorado, and this is, will be known as the Ludlow Tent Colony. Um, the National Guard is called out by. Um, sorry, I'm going to rewind a little bit. Um, when the miners go on strike, um, they put together a bunch of pamphlets. This is called the Colorado Strike Song. Um, this is an example of what the um, <clears throat> National Guard will use to protect the camp or to enforce Colorado laws at the camp. Um, and then this is just um, some more publications about what the, what the United Mine Workers is trying to um, encourage other miners and people outside of southern Colorado to know about what's happening um, in the mines. And so over here it says these are the seven demands. One is them is that they want recognition of a union. They want a 10% um, advance in their wages. They want a eight hour work day. They want to be paid for dead work. So if they're actually going into the mine, they want to be paid for that. At the time, they're only get, getting paid for um, whatever coal they get, bring out. Um, they also want their own check weighmen. So when they bring out the coal, the people that are weighing it are saying, okay, a ton of coal is actually 2,500 pounds because there's a bunch of other rocks that are put in there. Okay, and so we are only paying you for the coal itself that you're bringing out. Um, they wanted to be able to work, um, go beyond the company store. They wanted to be able to trade in their communities and be able to go to Trinidad and other areas to buy products. Um, and then the last one is we asked for the enforcement of the Colorado mining laws. So they're just saying we want the laws um, to be obeyed. When the National Guard is called out, and so let me be very specific, the National Guard is the National Guard as we would envision it today. So it's people that are volunteer military forces. And historically, the National Guards were used um, for strike breaking. The miners will also refer to them as the Colorado State Militia. And the reason they call them the Colorado State Militia is kind of a, a, a poking at them, saying you're not really in the army, you're just a militia that you've raised of yourselves. Okay. Um, so this, the strike will happen. Um, the governor of the state of Colorado, Governor Ammons, uh, he sides with uh, the National Guard with the company. Uh, the company um, in Denver, they will tell other Denver businessmen, hey, you don't really want to support the strikers because if there are strikes in the coal fields of southern Colorado, this could extend um, throughout the rest of the nation and this could affect you negatively. So the governor of the state of Colorado, Ammons, actually puts together what he'll call insurrection bonds. And you have a group of Denver businessmen that will pay to fund the National Guard. So it very clearly becomes a class war, where you have the miners, who are a lot of them immigrant populations, and the National Guard, who identifies themselves as Americans. Um, and then you'll have the company getting um, businessmen to support their cause through money. Okay. Questions? All right. Um, in January of 1914, uh, you have a woman by the name of Mother Jones, or Mary Harris, who's very well known as a union agitator. She will come into the mining camps, and people talk about the fact that she had a filthier mouth than men, um, and that she would basically tell the men, are you cowards? Um, are you willing to actually fight for your rights? I'm here willing to fight for your rights, but are you willing to do it or not? She gets imprisoned um, in January of 1914, and a group of 1,000 women will march through the streets of Trinidad in protest of this. As they're marching through the streets of Trinidad, the Colorado National Guard is present. The leader of the Co Colorado National Guard, John Chase, at one point falls off his horse. And the women turn to him, and they start laughing at him. He gets up on his horse. He turns his horse around. As he turns his horse around, his spur on his boot for his horse actually strikes a woman in the face. Um, and he orders to ride down the women. So at that point, the National Guard divides the women up um, writing them down to try to stop um, this protest or the strike. The people at Ludlow hear of this, and so it becomes very clear to them that the National Guard is not there to defend their rights or defend what's happening to them. Okay. Um, Mary Petrucci, who's also living in the coal camps at this time, or living in the Ludlow tent colony, um, remember the song, it talked about the, her desire to catch the train to go to Trinidad. 
Okay. So she has a young boy, Bernard, who's sick. Um, he probably has the flu. And she wants to take him um, on the train to go to Trinidad. And Trinidad's probably only about 10 miles away. Um, and she goes to the train station, but the Call National Guard won't let her on the train. So she has a sick, so I want you to imagine having a sick kid, right, about four years old, who can't breathe, who's super, super sick, and you know if you can get him to a doctor that there's a chance that he'll live, but you are physically unable to take him because his National Guard won't let you. Bernard ends up dying in February of 1914. <coughs> okay, so for Mary Petrucci, this is very much about the lives of her children and the lives um, of her spouse, okay? Um, the National Guard will also, <clears throat> this is a, a death special, they ha it was a mounted machine gun, and they would ride it through the tent colony um, to terrorize the people that are living in the tent colony, and then they would shoot into the tents um, throughout the winter of 1913 and 1914. The winter of 1913 and 1914 is considered to be one of the coldest winters in Colorado history, so you're living in a tent um, at that time. So you'll have the National Guard take the death special and ride it up and down through this. Okay. Um, John D. Rockefeller in the spring of 13 is um, sitting before a congressional hearing and they're talking about the fact that you have all of these miners that are in strike in southern Colorado and he's talking about the idea that it's okay that they're on strike because we need to start developing ideas about what labor looks like and what my company union might look like and his argument is we don't need a union of the miners to coming together we need a union that's run by the company um, and so these are some of the, some of the questions that he's asked. Um, so this is Rockefeller talking here. And then right here is one of the congressional um, individuals from the congressional hearing saying, if you will do, so we basically think this is what I think is the interest. We need open camps. We need to expect that no matter what happens at any cost, we can't let them unionize as part of the United Mine Workers. And so the question that is asked to him, and you will do that if it costs all your property and kills all of your employees. And his response is, it's a great principle. Okay. Um, on April 19th of um, 1914, it's Greek Easter. Um, and so you have the Greeks that are in the mining camp. Um, they want to celebrate their Easter. They have a, a baseball game. In the middle of the baseball game, three or four National Guardsmen come to the middle of the game. They try to stop the game, and they tell them, you've had your fun today. We'll have our fun tomorrow. Okay. Um, on the morning of April 20th, of 1914, um, it's questions of actually what happened, um, but there is an exchange of gunfire. Um, both sides think the other side is the one who shot. The National Guard will attack the camp. Um, the people in the encampment try to get out. One of the individuals in the encampment by the name of Louis Tikus um, tries to go to the National Guard and ask them to stop the fighting so that they can pull the women and children out of the tent colony. Um, he's hit in the back of the head with the butt of a rifle, and then he's shot and killed, he's left on the train tracks for three days dead. Um, he, um, other individuals as well will try to get out. Um, Charlie Costa will um, try as well. He'll also get shot in the back. As he's dying, uh, the story is that he talked about his family and checking, wanting to make sure that his family was safe um, and still alive. Um, by the end of the day, um, the National Guard, in order to stop the fighting, they decide to um, pour kerosene um, on the tent colony and light a fire, uh, light a fire to it, so it burns um, everything down. So I'm going to play a little clip um, uh, called um, "The Ludlow Massacre" by Woody Guthrie. And it's um, a very well-known song, a very well-known musician <coughs> that's kind of talking about this. And this uh, Woody Guthrie isn't singing; it's a man by the name of John McCutcheon who's much Mc John McCutcheon who's singing it. spring and the strike was on they run us miners out of doors out from the houses that the company owned and we set up tents down in old blood low I was worried bad about my children soldiers guarding on the railroad bridge Every once in a while the Bullets would fly Kicking up the gravel Underneath our feet 
We were so afraid they'd kill our children. But we dug a cave about seven foot deep. We carry the young ones and a pregnant woman down into that cave to sleep. Um, so this is Louis Tikus um, lying out by the railroad tracks. Uh, the story is that the train continued um, to pass by um, during the massacre. At one point, the train will actually stop so that the um, women and children and the miners who are running away from the gunfire with the National Guard will be able to actually get across to a more safe area. Um, after the massacre, um, again, they said, said Louis Tika's body is left there. The trains will continue to go past. So every train that passes past Ludlow sees Louis's Tika's body there. And so people eventually go up into Denver and say, hey, what's going on here? And there's people down in Ludlow that have been killed. You need to do something about it. Eventually, the um, president of the United States will actually call out the um, federal forces to come in. Um, this is the hole or the cave that um, the song by Woody Guthrie is talking about. Um, the coal miners, they're living again in a tent. And when I say a tent, it's really like a tent, right? So you have one room that they're living in. It's uh, a stove usually to be able to heat a bed if they're lucky, maybe a mattress on the floor. But underneath um, many of the tents, they build an, uh, built an additional hole, and these could serve as root cellars. Um, this one specifically was used as a maternity chamber. And so usually um, the best way I explain it to my students is if you're a coal miner, that means you can dig a hole in the ground, and you can actually make it look pleasant. Right? So some of these were actually lined with fabric, so it literally looked like an additional room for them. When I say it's a maternity chamber, you have to imagine from the fall of 1913 until the spring of 1914 that you're going to have a number of women in the tent colonies that are pregnant. Okay? And so they're going to need a place to actually be able to give birth to their children. So this is um, what the whole um, <coughs> is there that they're talking about. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. I want to go back to Cetalina. Um, Cetalina um, Costa is one of these women. Uh, the story is that she's at a full-term pregnancy um, on the morning of the massacre. Um, she goes in with her um, three children to the tent cellar. Um, and then it kind of goes into debate. There are some people that say she gave birth in the tent cellar um, and that she gave birth to a child. Um, that didn't make it out of the tent cellar. You have um, 15 people go in the tent cellar, four of, the, four of them are women, 11 of them are children. Only two women will actually emerge from the tent cellar. Cetalina Costa is not one of them. The family story is, is that when they found her body, there were bayonet wounds in her back, and when they turned her over, she was holding her, she was holding her newborn baby in her arms. Okay. Um, again, her husband, Charlie, dies. So all of them will end up dying at the Ludlow Massacre. Um, when, they're in, when they go into the tent cellar, when the National Guard sets fire to the tents, is that all the smoke of that will actually go into the tent cellar and they'll end up suffocating. Um, so this is a, a grave marker um, to all of the family um, that's down in Trinidad. So you have Charlie Costa, who's age 31, Cetalina Costa, age 27, Lucy Costa, age four, Onofrio Costa, age six, and then baby Tony, who had died before the massacre. Um, the Petrucis, again, remember, we have Reuben, who will die, um, sorry, Bernard, who will die in February of 1914. Okay? So Mary Petrucci also goes with Cetalina Costa into the cellar because she believes this is the only way to protect her kids from the gunfire. Okay? But she's the only one that comes out of the cellar. And the story is, is that when she comes out of the cellar the next day on April 21st, she wanders to wherever people are um, and finds them and tells them, I don't know where my children are. I don't know what has happened to them. So everyone, go, everyone that she talks to goes back to the scent cellar, and this is where they find um, all of these women and children who have been killed. Um, Mary Petrucci, the, the first picture I showed you is a picture of the monument. The story is, is that she's the one who the monument is actually modeled off of. After the Ludlow Massacre, she will travel all throughout um, the United States talking about what happened to her children. And so one of the things she tells people throughout the United States is, I don't want what happened to my children to happen to other people. And so it's really important that we respect the rights of workers in, in our communities. Um, this are the names of the people who died in the cellar. You have Patria Valdez. Eulalia Valdez, Mary Valdez, Elvira Valdez, Rodolfo Valdez. 
the Petrucci children, um, uh, the Pedregones, uh, Roderlo, Cloriva, Cerlina Costa, Onofre Costa, and Lucy Costa. This is a picture um, of the Petrucci family, probably about five to ten years after, well, let me say ten years after um, the massacre. Um, and so you'll see there's these ki- bunch of kids there, right? Um, if you go back to this slide, <clears throat> it says Thomas holding baby Mary, Edna, Lucy, Frank, Joseph. Mary's in the back. Angie and Rose were born later. Right? So you have Lucy, Frank, and Joseph in this picture over here. But Lucy, Frank, and Joe had died at Ludlow. So Mary and her husband actually name a second set of children after the ones that die at the Ludlow Massacre. So there's this guy named Frank Petrucci who he lives, right? He actually died a couple of years ago, almost 100 years old. And his uh, daughter, um, Elaine Petrucci, used to speak at the Ludlow Massacre Memorials. And she said, I don't know, if it wouldn't have been for Ludlow, I don't know if my father would have ever been born because I don't know if my parents would have continued to have, or my grandparents would have continued to have kids. But I know for sure that it would, his name would have not been Frank. Okay. Any questions about that? Or clarification? You, things you think I might have missed. Um, the uh, eventually the uh, the U.S. federal government will hear of what's happening in Colorado. You will have um, dang, I cannot remember his name. You will have Upton Sinclair, who's living in New York at the time. He will um, go to the Rockefellers' mansion. He will knock on their door. Um, when he's kicked out, he will stand at the gates of the mansion um, protesting and saying, you have killed women and children in southern Colorado, and you have to answer for this. Um, so this is just a news report, uh, newspaper, President Wilson considers taking over Colorado coal mines. And then this is um, another newspaper article of the time um, talking about a plead for truce um, in the strike zone. And then over here you have this uprising in Mexico. So a lot of people were comparing what was happening in the Mexican Revolution at the historical moment to what was happening in southern Colorado and wondering if it was similar agitations um, that were occurring. Um, Wilson will call out National Guard's troops. They'll actually come to southern Colorado, stop all the fighting. But the strike won't end. Um, the Ludlow Tent Colony gets rebuilt, and the strike won't end until December of um, 1914. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the memorial um, in modern day. Has anyone actually ever been there? You've been there? Yeah. Um, so it's right off of Interstate 25. Um, this is the um, sign for the, mon- for the uh, monument. It's about 75 miles um, away from where we are. Um, it's nothing super exciting. Um, I tell students it's really a cemetery, um, more so than anything else. The people that died there actually get buried. Most of them get buried in Trinidad. Um, this is the hole, the Chavez hole, from the earlier picture and from the song um, by Woody Guthrie. Um, the National Guard, I'm sorry, not the National Guard, the United Mine Workers actually do cement it up to preserve it. Um, you can walk down into it. This is a, a metal do- door. When you pick it up, it's super heavy. And after you've gone down in, um, when you're walking back up and you slam it down, you can actually hear the slam. The slam will resonate. <coughs> and then that's the monument today. On the back of it are the names of the women and children, uh, the, the people that were killed um, in the tent cellar. I think for me, at this point, I want to talk a little bit more about reflections that I've had um, working on this um, experience. Um, I, I usually talk about this um, as I call it the, bl- the blood on the ground, is that when people go to Ludlow, some of them have experiences when they're there where they say, it definitely, it, it was very touching to me or it made me think um, about it. For me, it was something that um, after third grade, I had been in my memory, but it's really become something that has come, kind of come to live on. Um, in my mind Um, and I think about it a lot and I think the pieces that I um, think about are the fact that you had people who were considered American citizens who were working in the cause of building the nation through mining the coal um, who were not represented by their company at the time who didn't have voice to be able to um, fight against the system that was so unfair to them Um, I think a lot about the women 
um, because if the working conditions are so dangerous for the men, you have to think about what it's been like for the women. Well, the conditions may not have been as dangerous, but they have to live within these mining camps, and they have the reality of um, not just that their husbands are coal miners and that their grandfathers are, their fathers are coal miners and that their brothers are coal miners, but it's also the fear that it's going to be their sons. And most boys are going to start coal mining around the age of 14 years old. Okay, so for Mary, that's something that she's, Mary and Settling, that they're both going to be living with. So the idea to strike is not just about, hey, we want better work, better wages, we want to be able to shop at our company store. It's really about whether or not they want their husbands to continue to live and whether or not they want their children to be able to live. Um, one of the pieces that I think um, is always key is that they were fighting for what was the law of the time. And what they were doing was about their constitutional rights. And it became very clear that they, on a national level and on a Colorado level, were not seen as citizens and were not seen as being represented within this context. Um, For me, it's also about being a parent. Um, I used to never want to identify as a mom um, because it's just not something that I had ever really seen myself as. but when you look at the names and the ages um, of the people that had died and the children that had died, um, and I sat on the Ludlow Centennial Kish Mission from 2013 to 2015, and in that time frame, I had a four-year-old and I had a newborn child. Um, and so I would go to Ludlow with my kids, and I thought a lot about that. It's like my kids are basically playing on the ground that other kids had played on that had died. And it became very, very present to me that these are things that can still happen in our nation. And these are things that are in the news on a regular basis and happen in the basis of what happens when people are trying to fight for what they perceive as their rights, um, but that those are denied by other people who have more power. Um, Questions or comments? Nothing at all. Yeah. How'd they get their tents if they didn't have any The United supplies? Mine Workers came out and actually set up all the tents so for them. It was them. a union? It was a union, yeah. and then the union also collected money for them for food, resources, and everything else. The um, University of Denver archaeolo- archaeology team went out in the mid-2000s and did um, a excavations. And what they found in the tent cellars was they found... Um, cans that had been shipped in from other locations. Um, So it was um, people not just sending money to support the union effort, but people sending in food products as well. Um, So it became very obvious that it was, this was something that as a nation people were aware of and were sending money. And you'll see that even today. Um, It's a little bit harder because we don't have unions um, in the same ways that um, as historically as we did, but you'll still see that people supporting and you'll have, and it's not just United Mine Workers, but it'll be like the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, or it'll be the United Steel Workers that will also support these sorts of efforts. Anything else? Yes, Jeff. So that slide where it had all those demands on it? They yes. Ten cent or ten percent wage increase and all that. Did they have, were those all ever recognized, or was that just like eh, put it to the side? So I would say yes eventually. So um, one of the questions that I was asked. Um, so when I sat on the Ludlow Commission, we had to we had the opportunity to give a um, we had a panel discussion at the um, Colorado Historical Society or Col- History of Colorado, and it was myself, the regional director of the United Mine Workers, um, this guy Tom Andrews, who wrote the book Killing for Coals, which is a, considered the book on the Ludlow Massacre, and the um, National Guard historian. And so one of the things that we were asked is like, so wh- why does it matter, right? Or do they win or not? Um, and by all purposes, you would say, no, they, you know, you have this whole group of people that die and they, their demands aren't met. Um, and it was interesting because the United um, Mine Workers Regional Director says, well, how many hours a day do you work? <laughs> right. Um, and do you get paid in cash? Um, so that you, if you look at it from a long perspective, yeah, they win. Right. And they win because it's the idea. Right. Is that people should be paid for their labor. Right. People should be able to have say of what is a safe or an unsafe working condition um, in that moment. No, they, they lose. It's, it's and they lose terribly. I mean, like I said, women and children are slaughtered or massacred. Um, but it's also this idea of what is the role of people, of the idea of be, the right to be able to collectively bargain. And you'll see that put into national laws at different points. Um, but these are also questions that can come up even histor- or even today, is as we talk about, are we a industry that's going to look at um, renewable energy? Are we going to continue to use coal? And what is the actual cost of coal? And so one of the things, as a commission, a lot of the discussion that we had is that um, the Ludlow Massacre, it's an American story. 
right? It's this American story of people coming to this nation, immigrants coming to the nation, trying to live out the American dream and failing in some ways, others succeeding. Um, if you look at Southern Colorado, if you look at Pueblo, most of you in the room, if your families have been here for the past 50 years, someone in your family worked for the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, someone in here worked for the steel mill. There's tons of people in Pueblo whose family members worked for the steel mill who aren't steel mill workers, who aren't coal miners. Okay, so my grandfather was a coal miner, then he became a steel mill worker. My great great grandfather was a coal miner. I am not a coal miner, <laughs> right? And so, th- so that's the other piece of this: is that do people end up getting out of the coal mines? Yeah, it may not be in one generation or two generations, but that's what makes up the American story, right? Is that people come to this nation and people end up building the nation? Other questions? Yeah. Well, I wanted to think a minute about if they won. Um, And uh, at the beginning, you talked about how few Coloradans or Americans at large know of the history, and yet everyone knows Rockefeller. And so our national consciousness has chosen to remember this in a way that I at least think there's some serious loss there for us in the present day. And I would wonder if you'd speak to the cost of history in America remembering uh, Rockefeller and forgetting Ludlow, what that you know, does to the body politic and the workforce, et cetera. So at the beginning of this semester, I think it was this class, I asked them um, to write down the names of their um, grandparents and then their great-grandparents and their great-great-grandparents. And most of them couldn't do their great-grandparents. Some of them could do their grandparents. And I said, but you remember George Washington. You remember Thomas Jefferson. So explain to me why you've forgotten your own personal history, but you remember the national narrative. As we talked about that um, a lot throughout the semester, I think if you look at Southern Colorado, and, th- and this is one of the things that I think um, has made the or made the Ludlow Commission successful. Um, what um, the United Mine Workers continue every single year. There is a memorial, and there has been a memorial for over a hundred years, um, where we will come in the spring and we will go and we will remember. And there's always at least a hundred people there um, for the 100th anniversary. There was probably three to five thousand people that came out. So a lot of these stories are in our family's histories, but they're not necessarily at the national level. And so for me, it's the issue of I'm a big fan of privileging the local um, over the national because I think in the long run that has more impact. I think the other thing is is that when, for most of you, you know the Rockefellers are rich, but you don't know exactly how or far um, that wealth extended. And um, I, was, I had the opportunity to be... Um, in uh, New York City in uh, 2007, um, in the fall of 2007, and I um, was doing research at the Rockefeller Archive Center. And it's, it is one of the most beautiful archives I've ever been to, this beautiful estate. And I um, would uh, I'd stay in the city, and I'd take the train out to the Rockefeller um, archives during the day, and then I'd come back, and I'd go town, downtown um, into Manhattan um, at night. And you always kind of get drawn to Times Square area, and you go to Rockefeller Center. And I, and I had these moments as I'm going through the documents and being in these spaces, and I'm realizing how much money the Rockefellers actually had and how much influence they actually had. And at one point um, during World War I, there was, I found a telegram from Woodrow Wilson to Rockefeller Sr. asking him what he thought about what was happening in Europe at the time. Um, and so for me, it's also that issue of We live in a nation that privileges wealth. Um, We live in a nation that doesn't always acknowledge the work of the miner, the farm worker, as being um, a contribution. Um, So I think that becomes a question. I don't know what the answer is to that, is that this idea of we as a nation continue to privilege that company over the worker. But I think that the majority of us are the workers, and we're the descendants of the workers. And as we remember our history and we think about our place in the nation, that's the piece that is powerful. I don't know if right now we're winning that. We mean, I'm like the commoners, right, the lower classes, if we're winning that struggle. Yeah, I I kind of feel like if we remembered Ludlow, all our unions wouldn't be broken and all our jobs wouldn't be in other parts of the world. I think the biggest piece about Ludlow as well is that when they're in the tent colony, they're cut across racial and ethnic lines, is that you have people that are Greek, that are Italian, that are Mexican. When you look at the names of the people um, that are killed, the massacre, you're talking about all types of everybody. Um, 
And they, they'll play music together, right? And that's one of the pieces that we were able to do um, for the Ludlow Centennial Commission is we actually had a concert and we brought musicians out from um, all over and um, they came and shared um, coal mining songs. And um, one of my colleagues had been very influential in putting this together. But you saw people, regardless of their, cla- of their ethnicity, being able to say what we're facing is wrong, but we're going to be unified as a people. And I think that's one of the other um, strong pieces that you see with Ludlow is this ability for Americans of different backgrounds to be able to unify and um, uh, fight for a common cause. Other questions? Yeah. So what was the, uh, what was the importance of women in this? Poll? So my argument is, is that if the women and children wouldn't have died, no one would even know about it today. It's the fact that women and children died that made it a massacre, that made it national attention. That's what Upton Sinclair was able to fight for in D.C. It was the death of women and children. So are they the storytellers or are they the, the martyrs? What do you think? I think they're, because they weren't, re- you know, women in this time period weren't, you know, seen as important or as, you know, like they're just child bears is all they are. Mm-hmm. And so as the time progressed, they became more important as you know, women's rights and women's suffrage. So they became, I think they evolved from martyrs to storytellers. And they became more important. So I would say that they were always important. At the national level, it may not have been perceived as that, and their stories may have not been recorded. But I think about um, this idea of who... Be- who so I, I usually care, I talk about it at the grandmother's kitchen table, right? Is that think about where, you, where did you learn the stories of your family, right? Is that most of you learned the stories of your family sitting around the kitchen when you're making some form of food, right? Those are the stories that get passed on. The stories in, within the household, but then, so that's one version of the history. And then there's another version of the history that's in the textbooks and everywhere else. It's important to come back to that kitchen table and say, were, are those stories valuable? to the nation and they're valuable to individuals and we preserve those stories they become important um, <clears throat> so then I'd also question like what does it mean if I tell the story right. right and so I think for me that becomes really important is that um, is it women telling the story today is it men telling the story today if it was a man giving the presentation would he even talk about the women um, I've given this presentation probably 15 20 times and when I come back to it I always come back to you have to start off with the women because for me, it's the women that were key because it wouldn't have been a massacre if it wouldn't have been women killed. And it was the devastation of these were the innocents, right? Any other questions? Yeah. During your research, did you find out if uh, a wife lost her husband in a mining incident? Or did she gain any rights to her, his wages or was there any compensation? So it would usually be depend on the incident. Um, the practice at CFNI at the time was if, it was the, if they could prove it was the fault of the worker, then they wouldn't get wages. If it was the fault of the company, then they would. And so there would usually be some form of mine investigation into it to be able to say who was at fault. And that's usually what ended up happening. V- investigators are employed by Rockefeller. In most instances, it's going to be it's the fault of the miner. And then it's also going to be your coal camp superintendent, whoever is in charge of that mine, whether or not they're going to extribute monies. So if, it's u- so if it's usually someone who's just come into the mine, they're probably not going to get any sort of wages or someone who's influential. Um, if it's someone who's influential in Cordowit, they might get something. Um, and then there was also um, practices um, in different camps um, where it was a... Um, a mutual understanding that everybody paid into a pot if someone died. So then it was kind of passing around the half, collecting, saying, what can we give this individual? But the company isn't necessarily going to take responsibility for anything that happens, which ends up being the reason or the need for the mining, um, uh, having a union um, exist. After the massacre, um, John D. Rockefeller, um, he and his father get put um, before congressional hearings. Um, He will actually come out in 1915. He puts together a whole um, company plan called the Employee Representation Plan. He will tour um, throughout Southern Colorado pushing this idea of there should be a company union. Uh, We should have representatives. We need to listen to what's happening in these areas. He'll come up with a social betterment plan as a piece of this. He will partner with the YMCA, um, and they will build um, YMCAs throughout Southern Colorado. 
Um, at one point, he'll actually come into um, the area of Trinidad, and he'll ask them, what do you, what do you need, whatever you need, tell me, and um, I'll get it for you. So at the Rockefeller Archives, there's actually letters from people in southern Colorado to um, Rockefeller Jr. asking him for uh, money for a bandstand. And so you'll have um, the emergence of um, uh, camps that, that include some form of social component as this. They'll, um, the company will expand and have field days, so they'll have summer activities um, for families. So there's an attempt to try to do this. Um, ultimately, it's not successful either because it's, the differences are um, of, of uh, uh, management versus that your workers are just too different. Um, what you do end up seeing, though, um, is Rockefeller in 1918 will actually come to southern Colorado when the monument is unveiled. And he will get out of his car um, to try to speak at the unveiling. Um, the person who pulls the, because uh, it's covered with a big cloth, the person who pulls the cloth off of the monument is actually Mary Petrucci. She's the one who pulls it off. So Rockefeller comes, he parks with some friends, he starts walking up. The United Mine Workers president at the time, Frank Hayes, comes to him and says, you should not be here. And if you stay, I cannot guarantee your safety. Um, I think it's this moment for me when I realized that Rockefeller didn't really get it, even though he'd come out and tried to fix it. He didn't get that he was the one that people had blamed for what had happened. Um, He leaves. He doesn't um, feel like he needs to stay there. Um, This last February, his uh, grandson, um, David Rockefeller, actually came out and spoke um, at the uh, Stillworks Center of the West for their annual fundraiser, and he gave a presentation about lessons learned from Ludlow. And he said... um, I think that my grandfather, that Ludlow stuck with him for the rest of his life, um, and that he really had thought about his business practices after that. Um, and they had reinvested monies um, into um, companies and then also to the ideas of corporate welfare. I think for me it's complicated because I have these moments when I think Rockefeller is, both Rockefellers, Rockefeller Senior and Rockefeller Junior are terrible men that did terrible things to people by wanting to control these companies and be able to amass this wealth. I also have moments when I think that they're human beings and they realize that they had made mistakes and they tried to fix those, but they, it was such a huge problem that they couldn't fix them. Um, the miners, I think for them, they're stuck in a terrible situation, that there was really nothing that they could do. Um, so, but I think it's, it's questions that continue to be raised in our society today. This is still, ideas of this still hit the front page of the headlines, right? Like, what do you do in North Dakota when you're having the discussion, when people in the communities are saying you should not have oil pipelines going through here, but you have corporations that are saying, yes, we need to have oil pipelines that are going through here. That question of fuel, that question of power, it still hasn't been solved even till today. Okay. All right. Um, for my students, I will see you on... Monday, I'm in a conference. Uh, Mondays and Wednesdays are conferences, so I will um, see you sometime next week. That will all be on Blackboard. Don't forget to check Blackboard to see um, what your assignment is for Friday and what time you're going to meet with me next week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. If you've been enjoying this podcast on Stitcher, please be aware that platform is ending operations at the end of August. But don't worry, you can still find this podcast and all of C-SPAN's podcasts on many other podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and the C-SPAN Now app.